Welcome to The Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast that's always available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on your favorite podcast app. My name is Aaron Peterson. I'll be your host for this special episode of The Hollywood Outsider. On occasion, we like to bring you interviews with independent filmmakers to kind of give you an insight into what goes into getting their projects made as well as insight into the respective art itself. This episode, we're kind of looking at the, the art of line producing. And you might not even know what that is, but I'm telling you, it is an extremely integral part to film production, especially anything that requires a location shoot. So joining me for this is Nicholas Simon, who is the founder and managing partner of Indochina Productions. Now, what Indochina does is they produce feature films with budgets from $1 million to $250 million, from development through pre-production, overseeing production, post-marketing, and sales. They have a strong focus in budgeting, scheduling, physical production, and talent crew relationships. It's kind of complicated, but Nicholas is going to allude to much of it in his interview, so I'm going to save some of that. Nicholas Simon is the founder and managing partner of Indochina Productions, which you can find more information at Indochina, I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-A, productions.com. And in full disclosure, I met Nicholas Simon at a an event for the Beloit International Film Festival, which I serve on the board of directors of. And you can find more information about that at BeloitFilmFest.org. And he's trying to help us grow the festival and help us establish some contacts to do many things that will help expand the film festival, the Beloit International Film Festival, BIF, as we love to call it, into a greater foothold in terms of the festival circuit. He's an absolutely great guy, wonderful to talk to, very genuine and open, and willing to talk about anything. And just to give you a few properties of note, he or his company have worked on The Five Bloods, Extraction, uh, recent indie titles, Avengers Affinity War and Endgame. You know, they, they've been involved in a lot, a lot of properties, and especially Kong Skull Island, which he does talk o- about quite a bit in the interview. So for this interview, I, I just wanted to let Nicholas explain a bit as to what a line producer actually does, what it means to a film production, and, and kind of just let our listeners know how important that job is to many of the films that they enjoy. I don't want to waste any more of your time, but if you're looking... To find out more information about Nicholas or Indochina, go to IndochinaProductions.com. That's I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-A, Productions.com. And on the festival itself, it's BloitFilmFest.org. Okay, without further ado, let's get into our interview with the founder and managing partner of Indochina Productions, Nicholas Simon. Okay, I am here with Nicholas Simon, who is the line producer. And we're going to explain exactly what that is pretty, pretty shortly. But welcome to The Hollywood Outsider, by the way. Well, thank you. I feel like I'm, uh, even though I'm over the airwaves, I, I feel like I'm, I'm partially back home, back in the Midwest. <laughs> That's true, because you are, you're from here. We actually met at a recent function for the Beloit International Film Festival, as I'm on the board of directors, and you, sir, are offering your services to help the festival kind of grow into a, a bigger and bolder endeavor. I, I wanted to start by just letting everybody know that you haven't gotten, you haven't gone all Hollywood on us. You, you still remember your roots a little bit. Which is nice. Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, no, it's I uh, love it. I, I don't think I wouldn't be the person I uh, am today if, uh, you know, my first 15 years were spent in Sherland, Illinois and Beloit, Wisconsin. So know it well. Although you do have a wonderful Hollywood quaff of hair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can blame my Hungarian father for that. That's awesome. Yeah, he has one of those heads of hair you, everybody wants but can never attain. So it's nice. I always open every interview with the same question. When did you know you wanted to get involved in filmmaking? Was there a specific moment for you? There are sort of different stages. I think I didn't realize that I absolutely loved what I was doing until about 10 years into doing what I was that I was doing. Um, Hmm. You know, so my early 30s, after having started a a company, producing a lot of things, and then I realized, oh my God, this is you know, this is actually a profession and I really enjoy it. But, you know, movies have always been really um, sort of an integral part of my life. I grew up in, a, I mean, father's Hungarian, my mom's from the, uh, originally from the Midwest. I uh, grew up across the street from Beloit College. Uh, my parents um, got tired of the politics back in the uh, in '72, and uh, when our t- black and white TV died, as there was the uh, I think one of the Saturn V rockets was taking off, and it was about two inches tall in the width of the TV. It 
soon died. And then um, we never had a TV again in our house. So I ended up both uh, getting my sort of TV experience from um, uh, friends' houses, but then I always went to the um, Bullitt College, had two or three nights a week screenings at well, Oscar Mayer Hall. Uh, we always called it Wiener Hall. Of course you would call it Wiener Hall. That just makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it's always introduced to movies, you know, like the Marx Brothers, uh, by the Marx Brothers, by Buster Keaton, to Woody Allen's films, to, um, you know, French New Wave. And they were all in 35 millimeter prints. And, you know, be screening in an auditorium. And you know, I paid a dollar and, and was transported. Well, take me on this journey of yours. Like how, because it's really quite a story. How did you go from, you know, small town Beloit, Wisconsin to running Indochina in Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos? I mean, that I know the story, but nobody else is going to know what that story is. And I think it's fascinating. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's um, it's it's not a usual one, and and probably one that a lot of parents don't want their kids to hear. <laughs> but um, I was 15 years old. I I read the Preppy Handbook. It was a popular book back then, and I actually took it as a work of nonfiction. I became intrigued with uh, going to you know boarding schools just because it's I. I guess it was before every ADD and everything, but I had, I don't know if I have ADD, but it's, I just had a short attention span and, and I, you know, was, was clamoring to, to open up my world. My dad was a professor at Beloit. I'd gone to day school, Keith country day school down in Rockford um, for three years. And then I, uh, sort of on a whim reading this book, I, told my parents that, you know, they had a choice, either I was going to go to boarding school or jail. And I think that I was on the route to go to the B option um, if I if I didn't, you know, sort of apply myself. And um, I ended up having the good fortune. I was a scholarship student out at uh, Phillips Academy in um, Andover, Massachusetts. And I went there for two years. And it really opened up my world in a lot of different ways. And ironically, I went to school there. Uh, another uh, woman from Beloit, Robin Roberts, uh, went the same year as me. So it was funny, in the school of 1,200, we had two people from Beloit the same year. Wow. It's, I'll, I'll do the edited version, but I ended up <laughs> okay. as a scholarship student at uh, Columbia University. And I really have always loved journalism. And I thought of sort of, you know, the romantic ideal of, of, you know, Hemingway in the 20s and 30s. And I had a number of opportunities to either be a photographer or a, um, a journalist um, in Cambodia or Vietnam. And um, after I borrowed money from an ex-girlfriend's mother, um, I uh, uh, bought a ticket. And after I bought the ticket, I found out that the job that had been, one of the jobs that I was going for had actually been offered and given to someone who was a closer friend from the guy offering it out. And I was actually one of 10 people who were thinking that they had the same job. So instead of going to Cambodia and being a, a photographer for the Cambodia Daily, I ended up compiling a bunch of uh, uh, um, names and numbers of friends of friends. And I ended up soon after arriving, uh, room, uh, being a roommate with a um, Russian, you know, graduate from Moscow University, probably, um, you know, KG, KGB trained. And um, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> most, most likely, you know, yeah. everyone thought that I was from Langley. So that's insane. But this was, yeah, this was um, Saigon back in 1994, so it was before um, the, the trade agreement was signed by Clinton. It was, you know, very restrictive. Uh, it was really the sort of the Wild West. You know, no one asked everyone's last name. I made my first money um, brokering an oil, or as we say now, acting as a consultant to a Russian Vietnamese joint venture and a um, French oil rig consortium. Um, to, for a contract to repaint three oil rigs. And I actually, I got paid in a paper, ba cash in a paper bag and um, made it out alive. Realized it wasn't totally sustainable, but then met um, a very good friend of mine. His name's Ben Lajover. He's now the international line producer for The Gray Man. Uh, the Russo brothers are shooting. Oh, nice. And 
and he was uh, the UPM uh, you know, production manager for a French movie called Cyclo, the second uh, movie of the director who did, uh, Tran and Hoon, who did um, Scent of Green Papaya that was nominated for an Oscar. Okay. And C- Cyclo ended up, it was 100% shot in Vietnam. And it's one of the first movies, you know, after 75 to be sh- foreign movies to be shot there. They ended up going on and winning at Venice. And I helped with the post-production. The two of us had, um, there were, he had an idea initially, and then I, he realized <laughs> it's easier doing business with an American. And um, the two of us started the first um, joint venture with Liberation Film Studio and a company called Lazenek Vietnam that's now called Sudest. And uh, we started producing TV commercials for the local market and line producing international projects that were coming through. And can you explain what line producing is? Because that I would explain it as you basically run the entire production in whatever country you represent, but you might define it even clearer. Yeah, it, it's um, there are a bunch of titles, whether you're in the union or not in the union, and it's it's very similar to the unit you know, production manager um, title. So you're working directly with the director, the um, first ads really like the and the creative producers and the dp like the creative you know head but i'd say you're one step slightly removed from that where you're not really you're running the budget and offering you know if the director says you know they want you know three blocks of five story city streets locked off you offer them the options you tell them the pros and cons um you know at some levels is a glorified travel agent on other levels you actually are really in the creative mix like for example just to give people an example like you did extraction were you involved in that whole long shot that they did where it was on the streets uh, that, that was um uh all shot in india so okay. they f- shot 15 days in india and then um i think that we did what was it 50 days or 45 days first unit 35 days or 30 or 35 days second unit and then we did um what's called pickups after they did the first cut they realized that they needed you know to develop some characters more and and just the sequence and the action wasn't playing out in the right way so basically we we shot more things with the principal actors and that was another i think um 20 or 15 days or something so we, in the end we shot 80 to 90 percent of um the first unit stuff all in uh, you know with chris hemsworth and 80 to 90 percent of the movie was all shot in thailand so they had been prepping in in india for um, a long time and then they had to, and they were originally going to do an India-Australia split, but they had to pivot to Thailand just because a lot of what was promised in India, which often happens, um, wasn't delivered. You know, uh, mm-hmm. helicopter permits, uh, I mean, basic stuff, but things that are very difficult there. Um, helicopter, drone permits, um, you know, it's an action movie and they couldn't import guns and stuff. So at the last minute, they dropped Australia, cut most of India and um, moved the bulk of it to Thailand. Interesting stuff. And so Indochina started uh, roughly around 2009 and then you kind of absorbed your sister company, Legend Films. into. Yep. And so you've been running as Indochina since then. What made you decide to you wanted to go off and just do this as your own venture? I guess. I mean, obviously, you have partners and whatnot. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 called having to pay bills. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they, so I came back. I sold my first company in Las uh, which turned into Sudest, and it's still continuing. But now they only really do local TV commercials in Vietnam, and I sold that around 2003, and I came uh, back. Um, I sort of had to reacclimatize myself. I hung out for six uh, six months in Maine, where my parents now live, and worked at a you know as a um, dishwasher at a Thai restaurant, sort of to get my bearings back after you know ten years off the razor's edge in Asia. And um, then I soon moved out to Los Angeles and. Soon after I was there, I coincidentally met my wife. And soon after I met her, um, you know, we started a relationship. And then I started really, um, but I ended up in a, 
in a marriage in 2005 and our, our daughter, wonderful daughter Lulu in 2007. I had the rights to a um, Vietnamese novel called The Sorrow of War mm-hmm. and had been trying to get someone like uh, Wayne Wang or of, of that stature to, or um, Ang Lee to direct it and wasn't able to do that. And so with the backing of her financier, I looked at directing it and that carried me along with producing um, independent films um, and documentaries in the States through till 2008. And then the financial crash hit, the financing fell apart for the um, Vietnamese perspective of the North Vietnam War, the Tsar of War. And my wife, who she was in business, she was one of the producers on Winter's Bone. And um, that was she a great really, movie. Uh, yeah. And uh, believe it or not, there was a day when Jennifer Lawrence uh, couldn't finance a $2 million movie. And um, yeah. Yeah. my wife. W- <laughs> my wife was instrumental in getting the original book to the um, director, Deb Granick, who my, my wife was a literary and um, direct, uh, director, writer, director, manager. And she was working with Deborah Granick then, got the book to her, helped um, close the financing. And then, you know, the, the movie really took off. But after the writer's strike, uh, my wife's business really changed. She was working twice as hard for a quarter of the money. And also our daughter was growing up in in L.A. She wasn't able to really see that much of her having a full time job. So the reason we started Indochina is um, for me to uh, sort of step in and and take over the financial handle. And coincidentally, in 2009, um, the crew of uh, Michael Bay's Transformer 3 contacted me, as did another um, film, Act of Valor. And they wanted, you know, and I'd known these people since before 2003. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, over five years later and people are still calling me. There's an opportunity there. And so with those two projects in Cambodia, Act of Valor and Transformers 3, we ended up starting Indochina Productions. Initially, it was just in Vietnam, uh, Cambodia and Laos. And then we took over Legend Films in Thailand and very soon after now we're in 14 countries. Um, the bulk of our work is done in Thailand and Japan. And then also Vietnam pre COVID was growing exponentially that's cool. as was Malaysia. That's crazy. I got a fun act of valor story. I'll tell you off the air. I won't tell you, <laughs> tell you what we're recording, <laughs> but, but, uh, it's funny. The, does Michael Bay, this is just a stupid aside, but does Michael Bay put lens flares in his, and his requirements is that part of the production budget? Do they actually put that in there? All right. Well, it, it's depending on who you're talking to. Fortunately or unfortunately, he wasn't there on that when we just did a um, a plate unit. So the DP, the VFX people came. We had uh, there's a sequence in in Dark Side of the Moon where you know they need to see that the stuff is going on all around the, the world, and so that we shot a lot of stuff in oh, Phnom yeah. Penh and also up at Angkor Wat. And so that was all like plate unit stuff. What I think it's funny is in terms of a line producer is probably one of the most important jobs on a film, especially if you're on location filming. And so many people, when, when they, they said that they know a lot about filmmaking, they only really know what a director does, what a producer does, what a actors do, writers, that sort of thing. Like the, the top five front people of a production. But line producing is extremely important for location shooting because if you don't have those people on the ground in the areas you're going to, your whole production can be chaos. What's funny to me is you, you've you worked on like The Five Bloods, which is, you know, I, it's still a big endeavor, but it's a much smaller endeavor than Avengers, but both require the kind of work that you do to different scale or they couldn't even get the movies made. Does it ever frustrate you as doing what you do that people don't even understand what that job is sometimes? Uh, let's say I'm 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 too old to be frustrated now. <laughs> um, at least about that. I mean, it was interesting. My parents, you know, over all the years. So I went to Asia first in 1997, and then I'm still there. My parents came once um, pre 2003, and then they came. They're both in their 80s. They came in 2019, and we had extraction wrapping up. In extraction, we had. 450 people without talent on the first unit, 300 or 350 people on the second unit. We were also doing Finding Ohana, 
another Netflix project that had a crew of, I don't know, 300, 350 and huge set builds and water tank builds. And then we were doing, I think, you know, four TV commercials a month. And my parents came over and spent a month um, with myself, my wife and daughter. And when they went to set, they were like, oh, my God, we finally realized <laughs> what you do. And <laughs> what was in, what was interesting is that it's also I really see, you know, it's not only a line producer, but I think a lot of the producers is if you if you prep properly, if you set things up, uh, managing expectations, getting you know the right people in the right jobs is the shoot should actually be, you know, the easy part or easier part for a producer. There are always calamities and stuff, but it's really if you put in a strong team who's right for that movie, it it should sail. So that's one way that I've been able to, I've often like um, on extraction, I shared the line producer credit with uh, Benoit Jobert, who I knew who knew who's really good. But I also had to, I was working with Michael Mann on a project that isn't yet going through Cold Way 1968, which would have been like Band of Brothers um, set in Vietnam during the Hue Offensive. Mm. You know, uh, it was interesting because I got uh, Benoit to come over at the last, <laughs> like literally he had, I think, 48 hours to get over. And I um, had some convincing with uh, Netflix and he ended up really running that production and I was standing back. So we shared the credit. But now, you know, he ended up um, doing the um, Patrick Newell and the Russo brothers have just you know, they've taken him away from me. He um, he was the uh, international line producer for um, Cherry. Um, the uh, oh, who's, who's the guy that plays Spider Man? Tom Sorry. Holland. Tom Holland. Yeah, Tom Holland. So it's the um, movie set uh, during um, Iraq. Tom yeah. Holland plays a bank robber who has PTSD. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So Benoit went off, and you know from. He did such an excellent job on Extraction. Then he was hired by um, the executive producer on Extraction to go do Cherry. And now Benoit's working for the same producer again on um, The Gray Man. So I guess what I'm saying is that it's really about, I feel like, about putting the right people in the right place. And there just aren't for these weird places like Bangladesh, even Thailand, there are so few line producers or key top local people that we've really made an effort. You know, it's there's a, another project we're doing with New Regency that I'm a co-producer on, Gareth Edwards project, and we're, our line producer is a Thai woman, Pam, who's fantastic. She was production manager on Extraction. She was production manager in Vietnam for Kong. And now she's running the show for a 15 week shoot in Thailand. And six, uh, we're looking at six weeks at, afterwards. And so it's really about like building lo local crew and, and sort of developing from within. I'm a bit all over here. Apologies. For that. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. And I assume safety is a big part of the equation too, right? You have to make sure there's a lot. You make sure that local and uh, it, safety it, protocols mean, are followed. Our safety protocols are all built on the U.S. standard. You know, there are sometimes realities of working in in places that certain things um, are easier. But you know, for insurance reasons, for um, you know, especially when the studios are our clients, you know, there's standard protocol that we have to do. And, you know, you just want to do it, whether you're in Bangladesh or or Thailand and you're working with helicopters and explosives. And and what we've been able to do is really bring international standards to places that one wouldn't think normally has them. So what are the, what are the biggest challenges in doing what you do? You know, I was trying to think of a, a film like especially a mega production like an Avengers infinity war or something like that. I mean, does that encompass reserve? Well, I mean, entire it, miles every, every project has such different challenges and, you know, it's I started as a line producer and ended up as um, a creative producer with James Seamus on a prayer before dawn that we did for way under $2 million, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I mean, way <laughs> under, and it ended up premiering at Cannes. We had a 15-minute standing ovation. We sold the A24 in the States, Netflix in Asia. It's been distributed around the world, and it's you know, it's in Cannes at a midnight screening, it's screening at the Palais, and you know, the last three days we ended up shooting in a live Filipino prison, the one that's famous for the Michael Jackson videos, where they you know all da- dance in like three thousand people dance in sync, yeah, because yeah. I realized you know on a million plus movie the only place i could afford 5000 extras or 3000 extras a night for the final scene was a live prison and so we did a deal with the local authorities and we were able to shoot there you know everyone got the compensation and we had thousands of extras for three nights that's insane and yeah you, and you have to organize all of that yeah so you know on lower budget stuff it's uh, only two or three people tried escaping during our shoot no <laughs> one made it out but the challenge on on that movie is how do you make a little money go as far as as far as possible and also i mean i got the ultimate compliment from um the director jean jean stefan servier via someone someone called him about how it was to work with me and he goes you know it was amazing on this I mean, extremely low budget movie. I never had to ask for anything. I kept getting everything I needed. You know, I mean, he was also adaptable, so he wasn't asking for the impossible. But you know, we ended up shooting for 33 days on uh, on a small budget, and you know, the extra count I think was something probably like 15,000 in the end. Wow. And it shows in the movie in the end, and that's why we went to Cannes, and that's why we. So it's. It's where whether wine producer, honestly, whether I'm a cater or whatever, it's our responsibility to like let let the movie breathe and let it live and give the a director the uh, you know and shield them from all the logistics so that they can really go and create. So it almost sounds like the bigger budget productions are a little I don't want to say easier but more manageable because you have more money involved. Really. Uh, I mean, it's so the conundrum there is. I had such, you know, it was a dream for me having first gone to Vietnam in 1994. I'd always wanted to bring first unit of a major film there. And, you know, we'd done plates and stuff for Pan and other other movies, but first units, all the main actors, it's like a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. You know, so Jordan, the director and Eric McLeod, the, the executive producer, main producer on that. During the scout, they saw that this was unique. It was right for the movie. And Eric really made it, you know, financially possible and logistically like, but, but essentially it was like, okay, we can, we can get, they were willing to bring the whole team, but my responsibility was, okay, once the team arrives, I've got to make sure that everything runs. And doing that in a communist country with no previous thing of handling a project of this magnitude. That is really daunting. Which film are you speaking? Which one? A Kong Skull oh, Island. Kong Skull Island. Okay. How much of how much of Kong was shot under your purview then? Um, a third of it. Wow. That's a, a third lot. of it. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we shot it in uh, near the world's largest cave complex in a national park co- called Fungya Kebin, mm-hmm. and for a couple of days, which is in the center, and then we had to move. Um, a thousand about a thousand miles or 800 miles to a, a place right south of Hanoi called Ninh Bin, where the main set builds and stuff were. And then our final sequences were all in Halong Bay. But in Halong Bay, we had to um, build, you know, we had two car ferries that were tied up side by side. We had, you know, I don't know, 30 speedboats going every day back and forth. Our base camp was on the two ferries, wow. you know, and all the all this in a in a country where it's like they've never seen, you know, even a medium size film, you know, ex- well they had they'd seen the Quiet American, but that was a twenty million dollar movie. This is two hundred million, and we're you know I forget the crew size, but it was easily four hundred people. And, you know, so one of the first things that I realized, and I actually went through a number of, you know, local partners, because I think that 
people didn't uh, either were too attracted to the amount of money that was coming in or didn't understand the size of what it was going to be. But I made it very important right off the bat that we had to make the prime minister's office. It's a very top down society there. Get the first, get the support of the Ministry of Culture and you get the permits through the Department of Cinema. And with their support, then go to the prime minister's office to garner their support. Because how do you clear, what was it, 70 tons of cargo and 200 crews in um, 12 hours? You know, and you're flying in special effects equipment and all this stuff. And, you know, then the, another thing we flew in, the uh, helicopter pilot, Fred North's um, A350 or helicopter, you know, is air freighted in and it had to clear. And this is all in a country where, you know, those things, it's not a carne country. It's not. And we were able to do it all. And it's, it's, you have to have the connections at the top, but you have to have the really strong workhorses, you know, in the day to day stuff. And that led to bigger, bigger productions coming into your. Production. I mean, it's we've scouted, we've scouted for you know Fantastic Beasts and Dungeons and Dragons and you know unfortunately nothing this big you know what was it the Five Bloods came afterwards but nothing this big has come since. Wow, that's insane! And you you also you work on the Mandalorian. I saw that. I didn't even know that. What? Oh, oh, sorry, but uh, um, yeah, I can't tell you where we uh, where we <laughs> it's shot. All, but, it's all private. Um, I mean, but again, that's a FX heavy thing, so it's not, you know, it, it's more. And I think more with volume stages, more and more location work. It's gonna is gonna go into the um, into the studio, and especially with you know COVID or whatever the next COVID is going to be. So now that you're in this next stage with the production company, I mean, what? What do you see going forward for Indochina? Like, what do you hope to do next? What's what's well, the, what's your goals? Our understanding that international travel is going to take a long time um, to recover, and that um, filmmaking it goes very sort of hand in hand with the tourism business. It's dependent on moving around and housing a large number of people in a timely fashion, and with COVID. And um, it's especially hard and that much more expensive. So you're having, you know, oh, our TV commercial business is basically dead, you know, and even feature films, the number of planned ones that have either been canceled, uh, the ones that have planned to travel have either been canceled or uh, reworked, cutting out um, a large number of countries is, you know, a, a huge number, the majority. We still have uh, a number of projects, you know, it's, I'm traveling this weekend for one. We have a, n- a number of projects that are, you know, looking at coming, but I think that, you know, the whole world's changed and we're not sure where, how it's changed. It's just going to sort itself out. <laughs> so what we, uh, I did do, and this uh, started a separate company called Studio Muso. And I'm uh, partners with um, a couple of Japanese people, um, one of whom is Gako Narita, who um, used to be head of Netflix Originals, and then also Harry Tanaka, who held a bunch of um, different general manager positions for Disney Japan, and is now on the board of uh, Studio Ghibli. And the three of us are have started a, a studio, not meaning an actual filming studio, but you know, we're acquiring IP, we're developing projects, we're close to closing our first um, series that we'll be producing. And then at the same time, you know, we're really trying to help, you know, Japanese um, content creators um, uh, have a stronger dialogue with the West and vice versa. That's excellent. Congratulations. I hope that all works out. Yeah. Fun stuff is happening there. And then with Indochina, we're um, just by happenstance, there's some um, unscripted projects um, that people came to us that we might be um, involved in producing. But I'm really trying to, Indochina is much more about line production and production service. Um, and then Studio Musa is, will be, or is much more about uh, developing projects. And you're also Gareth Edwards, the true love. You're you're very involved in that, right? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the questions I got I got to close. I got to ask 
Do you have any fun stories? I mean, people love stories of productions, and it's kind of hard, obviously, when you're doing what you're doing because you're busy. But yeah, yeah, right. No, it's. I mean, just to get, to follow up with the Kong Skull Island story, you know, we were traveling around with a PA and had the location manager over the months that she'd scouted the whole country, I'd become really close with this uh, local Vietnamese um, woman, and. Um, you know, when we were having, I think it was we were having a production meeting and we were in the van, uh, we were talking about, you know, moving the whole crew over and they're all going to get on the plane because they're shooting in Hawaii first and everything. And to understand just how, like, new this concept of big movie making is, um, the um, Vietnamese um, production assistant turned to us and just said, well, how is he going to fit in the airplane? You know, how is King Kong going to travel here? <laughs> That's amazing. And, you know, and it is fantastic. And for me, it's not not that they don't understand. Once it's explained, they understand. But it, it's just, it's a different, uh, like, it's a different kind of movie making than they've been accustomed to. They're used to doing practical everything, right? I mean, everything is practical. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's, since that time, it's changed a lot in Vietnam, in all of these countries. But, you know, back in the day, it was all very practical. Thanks for telling people what Indochina does, because line producing, I think, is, is definitely one of the most important jobs that happen on a film. I mean, if you go look at the credits of any movie, you're going to see line producing across the board. And there's a ton of credits that always follow it. <laughs> but nobody really talks about what those jobs entail. And I mean, it really, you cover everything from the contracts to people on the ground to caterers to just about everything that happens while they're in those countries. Exactly. You know, it's, it's the gift of knowing a little bit about a lot of things. So, you know, even with that, you know, you're only as good as your drivers, as your craft service people and all that. You're the ringleader. And what are you hoping to do with Beloit Film Fest? I should make mention of Beloit Film Fest. Totally. So it's, um, I just wanted to offer my um, experience and connections. They have a, th- a couple of things that they're working on that I've helped them um, with up their sleeves. I'll let them make the announcement. But then it's also, I just realized, you know, in the state line area, there's such a, a wealth of, of active talent. I mean, in even reaching out to, I don't know if you know No Studio in in Milwaukee, but it's John Ridley yes. you know, who wrote yep. uh, Oscar winner from Twelve Years a Slave. Yeah. He has uh, sort of a bought a building. It's an incubator for filmmakers and interesting ideas. And you know, I'm like that's an hour away from Beloit, and you know, you've got I think I mentioned to you, you know, a Keith alumni, Sean Ryan, who um, did The Shield, and you know, he's really uh, a list. Hollywood person, and I'm just, uh, you know, for the Beloit Film Fest, I'm going, you know, and there are a bunch of Beloit College alumni, and you're just going, you've got a, you know, wealth of people out there. I'm happy to help you with that. Well, that's uh, really appreciative, sincerely, that, that you're willing to do that and uh, help us down home local folk. <laughs> oh, got to come back in the midst of winter. I think I'll be. No, you don't. Sa- sadly, on the on the beach of Thailand, sh- filming something. <laughs> but, uh, Nobody ever comes here in the winter. Trips are always planned from March to what October, and that's about when it stops. Yeah. What's your dream project? Now that you can do anything you want, I'm kind of curious. What do you want to do? Is there like a a big kind of movie you really hope to make someday? I mean, it's. I mean, this is going to sound incredibly corny, but it's sort of served me well so far. I just want to work with good people. And that's brought me from Kong Skull Island to extraction to um, projects we're working on now to prayer before dawn. And, you know, great things happen when you work with good people. So it's, I just really hope to continue that trend, you know, really looking to set up Indochina so that it can continue and grow, you know, beyond me. That's what you want to hear. That's the, that's the dream. To grow on beyond you so you can go off and live your life. And, and do the next thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thanks for joining me. Yep. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care. We'll talk soon. Right. Thank you, Nicholas. We really, really do appreciate it. Again, it's IndochinaProductions.com if you want more information on Nicholas. And also, thank you for listening to the Hollywood Outsider Podcast. Now, we have an episode every single week. We try to bring you interviews with filmmakers in the, the world of independent cinema when we can. So I really hope you enjoyed this one. We do a podcast every single week, so you can listen to us discuss film, film topics, other aspects of film and television, 
There's a lot of things that go in our weekly episodes, so be sure to check that out. Usually a new episode comes out every Wednesday. Thanks for listening to this one. Remember to subscribe and review us on whatever your podcast app of choice is, and hopefully you'll be back for the next one, which is always available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or your favorite podcast app. This is Aaron Peterson reminding you that the next time you head into the theater to see a project that Indochina Productions worked on, buy popcorn.